my interest in this uh, really relates to the fact that for most of my professional career, I've worked as a furniture maker. Uh, 39 years with Coney Williamsburg, replicating 18th century furniture with period tools. Um, so understandably, um, the discovery of a, a kit of tools in the island of Goldman in Sweden uh, was especially fascinating to me. Most of the images uh, that you'll we'll see tonight uh, are from this book. The Mace de Mir, fine. Um, and as you can see there, a, a Viking Age tool chest from Bolton. That's a, a fairly large island off the, the west coast, excuse me, the, uh, the east coast of Sweden. Uh, this is the, uh, the second publication uh, concerning uh, by uh, Greta Arvidsson and uh, I apologize for Saudi and Norwegian Gustaberg. They gave him, there was an earlier publication. Uh, this one was uh, 1999 by the Larson Publishing Company. So this is the, the site where this uh, this fine was accidentally pulled up out of the ground in 1936. 1936, uh, pulled up out of the ground again um, on the island of Gotland. Uh, Maestamir used to be the largest continuous fen in an area of land uh, repeatedly covered with water uh, on the island of Gotland. 2,350 hectares, we're talking about almost 6,000 acres, uh, comprised of swamps, ponds, pools, meadows. In 1902, for about a decade there, over the period of time, it was drained. The next slide is, is um, Hugo Kraft. I don't know if you can even, can that be focused any better than that? It's on the, uh, Yeah, Kraft was uh, hired by the, the farmer that, that owned this land um, to, to plow it. Uh, and again, this is the first time that this land had been opened and was dry enough to, to farm. Um, it says on the, on the first day of the work, the work lasted three or four days. Um, Nordby, the, the landowner, was present following the plow to turn the, um, the sod the right way and to assist Jungley. The next day, his place was taken by another farm worker, daily wages. Kraft could not remember his name, but he lived. Now this, again, this find was in 1936, and this was Hugo Kraft's recollection uh, in an interview in, the, uh, in 1979. He, uh, the first thing was pulled up, his plowshare snagged a chain and then pulled up a, a box that, that broke open and it was filled with, a, as Hugo Kraft uh, described it, uh, a gruel of rust. Um, just prior to that, uh, the plow pulled up a, he thought it was a, a bronze or brass cauldron, turned out to be a, a copper uh, plate uh, pot. You can hit the next slide there and we'll take a look at that. And I, ultimately two of these pots were pulled up out of the ground. T. 
10 and a quarter, and the other one was twice that size in its, in its diameter. And you can imagine uh, being so violently pulled up out of the earth. Uh, some things uh, didn't make it in, in very good shape. He thought it was a bronze cauldron, but it was copper sheet, copper plate. And this will relate to actually some of the tools that were found in this chest. And there's the very next pass uh, that snagged the chain and pulled this box up out of the ground. Take a look at that. And this gruel of rust turned out to be all manner of iron goods, chains, axes, sledgehammers, saws, all together weighing at least 40 kilo, 88 pounds. This is, this is, a, this is the, the largest Viking Age uh, kit of tools that's to date ever been uh, unearthed. So the first thing that the craft picked up picked up was a steelyard. If you all don't aren't familiar with this animal, it's, it's a scale, basically. The object you're weighing is, is fit onto this hook. It's suspended by a chain and then weighed with a new position. Like right? when you go to the doctor's office and you get it. <laughs> this this really doesn't do I saw a copy of this book in someone's lap here this evening. Yeah. This, well, yeah, kind of hard to, uh, but maybe you can share that with folks. And I have my own copy that I brought after I finish, and they can get a better look at some of these images. This really doesn't do the, the detail and the degree of finish on the seal of your justice. Uh, it's surprising the decoration, the punch decoration. On, on this piece of equipment. That, that beam there is, uh, is a good 14 inches long. Craft uh, also uh, picked up two what he called church keys. Those are keys. So kind of lock me. Keys in, in their length. These things were, uh, one was seven and three quarters inches long, and the other was eight and a half inches long. And these had uh, brass nodes on them. And there was some brass decoration in the steelyard as well. So uh, he, he took the, uh, the steelyard and the key home. His wife thought it would be a good idea. He did. To, uh, to uh, notify the uh, the man responsible for uh, examination of antiquities uh, in the area, and uh, after looking at it, uh, he said, "This is this is a thousand years old." Kraft had, had the, the still even the keys he'd strapped to his bicycle and rode them home. So when this when this uh, this fellow examined them and then took them with him, he carefully wrapped them in newspaper. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Kraft also picked up a, picked up a hacksaw on the far right there. It's a hacksaw, and he tried it out one of the other objects. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, real, real, you, know, you know, I don't know if I would have been any more aware of what was going on myself. Um, I mean, is this a metal cutting saw? You all are familiar with what a hacksaw is. And there are other items on this as well. Uh, those tongs are, are, if I recall, I think they're, they're close to two feet long. Uh, these trace rings, 
they would connect um, a chain uh, from a horse to a, a, a vehicle, a four, probably a four-wheeled cart. We'll look into some of these. The next slide, please, John. So I took the steel here in the key home, and uh, Carl Jakobsen was something that said, it's got to be a thousand years old. The chest itself, uh, I don't think the chest was originally intended to hold uh, this weight of tools. There are no handles on it, and it's relatively light in construction. The, the sides, the front and the back, and the ends are roughly three quarters of an inch thick. Um, the bottom <coughs> is held into, I call it a, a rabbit. In other words, there's a, there's a shoulder cut on the inside of the side, and the bottom lays up into that. And then it fits into what we call a, a dado, it's just a slot across the, across the end there. And then there's a, a tenon, an extension of the bottom, comes, comes all the way through the ends. And the, the front and the back are pegged, wooden pegged onto the end boards. So how do you pick this thing up if you got over 80 pounds of tools in it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's the um, iron strap hinges held the lid on. One was still intact and on the box, and the other one was, was there, but had, it had come off um, in the bottom to pulling it up out of the ground. And those were held on with iron nails. Roughly almost three feet long, 35 inches long, over nine inches tall and about 10 inches deep from front to back. Okay. So axes, adzes, this gruel of rust turned out to be an amazing assortment of tools. Axes, adzes, saws, chisels. So woodworking tools, um, among other things, the largest axe was eight and a half inches, eight and, about eight and five eighths long. The adzes, an adze is a, you can see them up above, it's a woodworking tool as are axes. And, and there was, there was, uh, there were tools that were in the process of being repaired. Uh, there was all sorts of scrap metal, some totally unworked, that was still to be fashioned into some other objects. Um, the Bayou Tapestry, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, a lot of these tools you'll see illustrated in the Bayou Tapestry. Uh, the far right is a, a chisel. This is the, that's the smaller of the two saws. Um, woodworking saws. The odd thing about that saw is that in a hand saw, so it doesn't stick in wood when you're sawing. Some of you all had uh, a problem with, you, you can't push the saw through because it's lost its set. And the teeth have to be bent ultimately left and right. On one of these saws, I've never seen it done before, and, and I, I doubt if it would work very well. Four teeth are bent to one side, and then four teeth are bent to the other side. And the other saw, the, the set is, is fairly uniform, ultimately, one after the other, left and right. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So yeah, the, the, uh, the person that uh, is describing uh, these tools in the book had no idea what was going on either. This is, a, is an iron for uh, making nails. It, you all have been to Coney Winsburg or you've been to Jamestown and you watch the blacksmiths at work. 
They'll hammer out the nail. They'll drive it through a hole in this in this iron and drive it down, and then they'll they'll flare out the head. You see these roasted, supposedly roasted nails. See, there's also a knife blade in that illustration on the right. Um, shows the saws. The largest saw is two feet long. The smaller saw is 14 inches long. What amazed me is that most of the woodworking tools have steel edges. Steel um, has a, a larger carbon content than, than just iron. Um, these, these tools were analyzed and on many of the, the edge tools, uh, there was a steel edge of 0.4% carbon uh, and then the body of that tool, say an ax or an adix or a chisel, was 0.02% carbon. Now, that doesn't sound like a, a big difference, but it's significantly enough to where at 0.4% four, four, at you have much stronger edge retention. Uh, again, if you visit the blacksmiths in Koenigsberg, you can watch them hammer well. They take uh, a piece of iron and they heat it up red hot. Uh, steel, uh, again with uh, iron that's had carbon worked into it, they, they put a little bit of flux on there, they lay one onto the other and they they fuse them together by hammering them. It's, it's quite a skill. I, I'm not a blacksmith. I've watched it being done. Uh, but the fact that 1000 uh, AD, or, or even earlier, they're hammer welding edges on, on edge tools, working tools. I, I was just repeatedly surprised at the refinement of the tools that were being used at that time. Including the next slide, John. <coughs> These are spoon bits. They vary in length from six and a half inches, the smallest one on the far right there, the top right, to 17 and 3 eighths of an inch. So, six and a half inches to 17 and a half inches. And again, the edges are steel. It's been hammer welded onto the iron shank. Uh, today, if you're into making Windsor chairs, spoon bits are still the preferred tool for drilling the holes in the seat and other members. The beautiful thing about them is you can change the angle of the hole as you're drilling it. You try to do that with uh, most of the bits you buy at the hardware store today and you break the bit. Uh, so that they're still being used uh, in this present day. On the far right at the top, uh, that tool on the right, it's it's labeled in the book uh, a draw knife. That's not a draw knife by Western English or, or American equivalent. It's an in shape. Uh, you can use that for shaping out a, a cavity in something. So once your chair maker used that for scooping out the, the seat. So you fit a little better. And the, the in shape on the top left there is for shaving in a molded edge. The tangs on these, there were wooden handles on both of those, and then the, the, the tang is bent over. Uh, some of these, some of the tools in this chest still had remnants of, of wood on them. One of the saws still had its wooden handle. It's amazing after a thousand years in the ground, how do you do that? 
Uh, this is a whetstone here in the far right and bottom. It's for sharpening. Next one, John. So the rasps, files, there's a round file. Again, I mentioned the nail making iron top right. Uh, there were wire draw plates. Some of these plates with the holes in them. You could you start the wire and you, and you pull it through, and as you pull it through, it it it, it stretches. So it's smaller and smaller. And, and I don't draw a wire, I'm not a metal worker. I think you, after a while, it's gonna work hard and you have to kneel it again and draw it through successively finer and finer plates. I know there is jewelry from the culture that dates way back that's decorated with metallic wire. So I mean, what was this, the guy that, that owned this kit of tools, you know? Some of these tools are for fine work. The files are not that big. Um, the largest rasp, that dog leg on the left there, is 11 inches long. Uh, some of the files are quite small, six, seven, eight and a half inches, a round file. The skeleton cut a file for a rasp that works. Okay, the next one. So what surprised me is that there were woodworking and metalworking tools both in this kit of tools. And some of the tools, considering their scale, were for relatively fine work, not just coarse stuff. There were seven hammers all together. Some of these hammers had steel faces. In other words, the face of the hammer had a higher car carbon content than the body of the hammer. It was a sledge. If you've uh, seen them hammering in Corner Williamsburg, when they have a lot of shaping to do on a, on a piece of iron, they'll double strike. Uh, the smith is in charge of that particular operation He'll hit with his hammer, a single-handed hammer, where he wants the other man to hit it with a, a, a larger hammer to gradually flatten it out and spread it out and to, to final thickness. Uh, the largest of the hammers in this was nine and, a, nine and seven eighths of an inch long. It was over seven pounds, almost seven and a half pounds. That's a pretty good size hammer. And yet, the smallest hammer was just not even six inches long, uh, not even a pound. And perhaps you can see, see the round face there? Ever try to hit a nail with a, a, a hammer and the face has been all beat up and you know, you just, That round face is from metalworking. The bottom right um, is a small um, can't take that right now. <laughs> it's a small anvil. It's called a beak iron. So again, they're they're tools for not just smithing, but for plate work too. Uh, for this is a, a shear. Those cauldrons are copper plate. Uh, some of the plate in this kit of tools was two millimeters thick. So that's that copper is, is hammered out, you know, to that thickness. Uh, that beak iron is for curved work. Can you see the cross section? So you lay that plate on it, and then you can you can shape it to whatever round contour you want. 
And again, these, these tongs um, are like almost two feet long. Good thing that uh, Kraft didn't try using too many of these tools. Uh, there's still, still some wood that was found in, in some of these hammerheads and some of the axe heads as, and axes as well. Okay, the next. Um, this is something that was totally new to me. It's a fire grid. This thing is uh, 20 inches, 20 inches square. And say you're in the in the forge, and of course it, it's a little dim in the middle of the winter, but you still have work to do. So. You have fat wood. Well, of course, the grid would be complete. And you have fat wood on top here. It's burning. It's giving you light. That's suspended from the ceiling somewhere to give you light. It sounds really bizarre to me, but... Yeah, yeah. Again, there are the keys on the, on the right. The trace rings. Those trace rings were uh, like four inches in diameter. And the keys again. Ah, oh, this is fascinating. The next slide. Bells. These are cowbells. Um, the largest of these bells is 10 inches tall. And it has a, a double clapper, which is um, quite unusual for this time and place. Um, it's made out of uh, sheet iron uh, that was folded, as you can see in the bottom right, and riveted together. And then it was, it was, uh, what's the proper term? It was coated with copper on the outside. Copper clad. And uh, it was speculated in the book that it was a uh, processional bell, maybe calling people to worship. Um, But again, these double clapper bells, uh, these bells are quite unique for, for Scandinavia. The padlocks, padlocks really surprised me. Um, these aren't like those large padlocks you see in Coney Wingsburg um, that, that we used at the shop as well. The largest of these padlocks is just one and three quarters of an inch just not even two inches. And, and the smaller one is just over an eighth of an inch. Uh, excuse me, just over one inch. Uh, these padlocks were, were uh, there were traces of brass in these padlocks, so they were, they were clad with brass. Um, again, this is the largest Viking tool find in all of Europe. And what's significant about a lot of these tools, the, the padlocks included, is that they're very, very similar to early Roman tools. Um, the padlocks are very similar to padlocks in the next slide. They came up out of the side of a of a Roman fortress in Salzburg, in the Germany, near about Hamburg. It's in, in Hessen. Uh, that uh, fort was along the northern frontier of the Roman Empire from about 90 AD to 260 AD. And these, uh, these three padlocks are very similar to the locks that were pulled up you know, out of the side of Salzburg. Um, 
and also from padlocks that were pulled up out of a, an important Viking trade center of Birka, which was on the small island of Bjorko. And uh, excuse me for slaughtering the Swedish there. This was the uh, important trade center, Viking trade center, to about uh, 950 AD. And, and then uh, Gotland evidently became uh, the important center for, for trade um, off the, uh, the east coast of Sweden. So this is all, this is all Sweden. Uh, next slide, John. And what I've shown you uh, is literally the tip of the iceberg, if you consider. Literally be the, the tip of the glacier. Uh, some of you all have probably heard about secrets of the ice. Um, I'm going to quote from the, the magazine Antiquity. from a, uh, an April 2020 article entitled Crossing the Ice in Iron Age to Medieval Mountain Pass at Lendbring, Norway by Lars Pilo, Espen Finstad, and James H. Perry. Espen Finstad was trudging through mud in the Jotunheim Mountains of Eastern Norway this month. This article, uh, this particular article was put out in 2023, September, so this year, 2023, um, in the New York Times. Sorry, getting my articles mixed up. Was trudging through the mud in the Jotunheim Mountains of Eastern Norway this month when he happened upon a wooden arrow bound with a pointed tip made of quartzite. You can go to the next slide if you get to it. Complete with feathers, it was so well preserved that it looked as if it could have been lost just recently. But Mr. Finstad, a glacial archaeologist from the county of Inland, knew better. By his estimate, the air was probably about 3,000 years old. I was really excited, he said, I've never seen something like this before because it was so complete. The find, which Mr. Finstad and his colleagues believe belonged to a reindeer from the late Stone Age or early Bronze Age, is among thousands of artifacts and remains that have emerged from melting ice in recent years. As climate change thaws permafrost and glaciers around the world, the thaw presents a fleeting opportunity for glacial archaeologists. We must find the historical treasures just as they emerge from the ice before they are destroyed by the elements. We're sort of in a race against time, said Lars Holger Pilo, a glacial archeologist and a colleague of Mr. Finstad's. We really need to work even harder to save as many of these artifacts as we possibly can. For more than a decade, their team, which runs the Secrets of the Ice Project, has scoured mountain passes across the country. The project of cooperative effort between Inland County Municipality and the Museum of Cultural History, University of Oslo, was founded in 2011. Since then, the team has discovered about 4,000 artifacts and remains. If you'll go to the next slide including a thousand-year-old wooden whisk. I'm going to the next slide. We had one of these in, in Germany. We looked very simply when the army had a station there, and we used that little wooden whisk. You can see, not that particular one. The second image from the, from the left is just like that. A Viking mitten. Now that's a, a shoe in the far left, and the hair was on the outside. Um, uh, the archaeologists thought perhaps to give better grip on the, 
and the snow and the ice, a Viking mitten, a third or fourth century woolen tunic, woven woolen tunic. There's a knife on the far right. And the oldest pair of Bronze Age skis. You see the first one they uncovered. It, they went back the next season and the ice had retreated a little bit more. The glacial ice retreated a little bit more and they found the other ski just a, a few meters away from where they found the first ski. And when they flipped them over, I don't think they were that casual about flipping them over. The bindings were still on the skis. So what happened to the guy? What happened to the person that wore that tunic? Why on a mountain pass, a snow-covered mountain pass, would you take off a wooden, a, a woolen tunic? Was it hypothermia? And you're, you're, you know, I think you straight after a while. That's evidently one of the signs of that, and you, you start shedding your your clothes. Yeah. And more than 150 arrows uh, from a, as early as 1374 BC uh, to 1118 BC. Similar work is taking place in, in other parts of the world. For now, he and his colleagues are content with the 250 or so objects pulled this year, 2023 from the melted sludge in Norway, including a Viking Age knife, an iron horse spit, several more arrows, including a 3,000 year old arrow. They still had this, still had the feathers on the, on the arrow. What makes the arrow so impressive, Mr. Finstad said, is its preservation. Though it is broken into three parts, the arrowhead remains attached to the shaft as do the feathers known as fletchings, which help to stabilize the arrow's flight. Once the scientists carve and date the arrow, they can determine its exact age. Mr. Finstad, the Norwegian archaeologist who discovered the arrow, described the finding as one of his top 10 favorites because its near pristine state had helped him envision the lives of those who had lived and died in the same mountains. Quote, you also feel a kind of a special connection to the people who lost it, he said. So, as, as these archaeologists said, um, they're just beginning to pull out of the ice what is, is there to be found. Um, so I just wonder what your appetite for perhaps more to come in the, in the future. Norway, central Norway, has turned out to be the, the largest source of glacial artifacts from anywhere in the world. It, it's, it's really quite amazing. I think that's it. Yeah.